Well, I think we will go ahead and get started. Um, so, ooh, okay, sorry, just getting my technology in alignment. Um, yeah, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, so hello to the world. Um, my name is Erica Chung and I'm the assistant director at Photo Relevance. Um, for those of you who are new to Photo Relevance and our programming, we are a contemporary fine art photography gallery based in Houston, Texas. Currently on view, we have a group exhibition entitled Now You See Me, which includes works by the two artists who are here with us today, Tommy Ka and Leonard Suryajaya. I know our worlds have perhaps been feeling a little bit off kilter and exhausting as of late. And I'm grateful to the two of you and our audience, who we unfortunately can't see, but we know are there, um, for sharing in this virtual space nonetheless. Um, to the audience, be sure to drop any questions you may have into the Q&A box, and we will get to them either as we go along or at the end. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen really quickly. And hopefully I share the right one. Can you see this? Um, sorry, we can see this shared screen, yeah? Good. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is the second of three talks that we've been doing with the artists in our show. Um, our first one from a couple weeks ago is available on our YouTube channel and I'll drop the link to register for our upcoming one at the end of the hour. Um, but for now, we're here. Um, and to begin, I'd like to give you all a little bit of an overview of the exhibition at the gallery. Um, so Now You See Me features a total of six Asian American artists who I brought together in an effort to begin visualizing all of the different, you know, complexities and nuances to be found in Asian America. Um, as viewers, the intricacies found in each of these artists' narratives help us resist a monolithic interpretation of what being Asian American signifies, stretching the term beyond its everyday kind of demographic meaning as American citizens of Asian descent and into a realm that pays homage to its activist roots. So for those who don't know, the term Asian American was coined in 1968 by a group of students at UC Berkeley, many who were influenced by and stood with the Third World Liberation Front, the Black Power Movement, and the Anti-Vietnam War Movement. Uh, before this, Asian Americans were either referred to as Oriental or as being from their country of ancestry. By giving themselves a name, one that distinctly marks their Americanness, Asian Americans were essentially creating a political identity for themselves. As the activist Chris Ijima said, the phrase became less a marker for what one was and more for what one believed. As such, Now You See Me is premised upon the belief that Asian America is complicated, vast, and quite frankly, incomprehensible. <laughs> But this exhibition suggests that we might begin to understand it through the stories told by these artists and that the tales they leave are just as crucial to the American story as the ones normally ascribed to the canon. Tommy and Leonard, I brought the two of you together because of the shared humor and theatricality that are pretty intrinsic to your respective art practices and because of the fact that viewers at the gallery always seem to arrive at your pieces with a similar kind of curiosity. Um, so it feels like everyone I've spoken to while viewing your works wants to know, you know, what a particular item in an image is or where the picture was taken or who's in it or why something is the way that it is. Um, and I think this desire to ask thoughtful questions is sort of at the heart of approaching narratives that are outside of our own experiences with empathy, um, especially if we are okay with not always receiving easy answers that let us compartmentalize what we see and hear into neat categorical boxes of understanding. Um, and so with these thoughts, I'd like to turn it over to Tommy for an introduction to his work. Um, I'm going to go ahead and paste his like text bio into the chat so you can peruse it at your own leisure. 
Um, but I would like to stop hogging all of our air time. Um, and so Tommy, I'm going to yield it to you. Thank you, Erica. Um, hi. Uh, well, this is, that's my name. Um, so I'm Tommy. It's uh, thank you, Photo Relevance, uh, for having me, having us, um, having this, having space. I think is something I've been really thinking about in the last year or so. Um, the work that I included in the show is from a fairly recent body of work. Even though I've started this project, kind of, kind of at the seedling of it came around during um, my residency at Lightwork in January 2000, I want to say 15, 2015. Time is um, a wibbly wobbly slime ball is what I'm realizing lately. Um, but the picture that really uh, put everything together um, is this one actually. It's uh, Constellations. Um, I shot this in a prop house in Miami when I was on residency. Um, at Fountainhead, um, really great uh, organization. Um, but well, I guess like a uh, part of my work is using cell portraiture as a way to find an image or just or create a way to look for how Western image imaging has like influenced the way that uh, otherness is photographed. Um, photography is a Western invention. It's a very, uh, it's a very uh, ex in exclusive space that I, I felt like I came into an undergrad. And using mm, photography has been a way to sur survey uh, the different kinds of aspects that, uh, of my background. Um, I grew up in Memphis. I grew up in Whitehaven, um, which is about five minutes away from Graceland. Um, and I um, made this picture um, using a cardboard cutout of me. I am slightly freezing, so I'm hoping that if this will go well. Can you guys still hear me? Like, yeah. okay. Sorry. Um, and I, this was like a really great uh, uh, summary of these uh, all these products I've been thinking. I work in long form and generally like I um, have it, an, an issue with ending any projects um, at any given time. So I really think I benefit from have, um, having to having a process that is revisited and changed materials, the approaches and still coming from the same um, general state of mind of trying to locate this kind of identity. I've like informed by uh, my queer identity, uh, my uh, Chinese Vietnamese um, upbringing and uh, this set against like a very uh, southern landscape. Um, we can go to the next one too. Um, so the majority of these pictures are actually made in, in and around um, my childhood home which uh, uh, surprisingly got sold um, two weeks ago. Um, so I've, uh, I like the last thing, last time I shot it was the week of Christmas last year. And I was telling my mom, I will be back around spring break. And little did I know um, how much of that uh, did not come true. So um, my mom is someone that I, I frequently photograph. And a, a lot of times uh, these different bodies of work that I've continuously add and revisit um, and make pictures for tend to blend in with each other. I think they have a better conversation um, for with each other instead of like stopping and starting and creating a sequel to something that I still haven't resolved myself. And oftentimes my mom is a secondary protagonist in my work. Um, and she's um, as was a photographer briefly um, after she fled Vietnam in 1983 and arrived in London, Ontario in 1984 and gifted me uh, this album of snapshots she made um, the year during that year in Canada. It was just called 1984 Canada and I never knew 
about these pictures. And so I have been trying to incorporate her and her work into mine as a, and thinking about my work as a sort of spiritual uh, continuation of her work. Um, so oftentimes I like would use my mom as a stand-in for myself, an extension of myself, or since it makes sense that I share half my DNA from her, um, that when I photograph her, she becomes these half cell portraits. Um, and the next one is, you know, I never knew how I felt about this picture, but it was, uh, I've, I work with a lot of cutouts and all my work is done in camera. I construct a lot of the pictures um, through um, these kinds of plays and performances that are just for the camera. I don't really, I don't use Photoshop in the way of compositing anything. I think that's just extra work that I'm very lazy about doing. So everything is just uh, made um, and entertained for the camera. I think a lot about uh, Ocean Vung's uh, recent book about uh, monarch butterflies and how, uh, I think the quote is here, the monarchs that fly south will not make it back north. Each departure then is final. Only their children return, only the future revisits the past. Um, and this is also shot in my childhood home in the creepy ass attic. Um, that I am really glad to not um, have it, not to go back there because I, I, I'm really pretty sure that the, this house was haunted. Um, sorry. And I'm glad my mom will not watch this. Uh, but a lot of uh, my work is about these, how ultimately photography is this broader influence on the way that we look and perceive um, otherness. Um, and I think we can go to the next one as well. Um, I like to change my materials um, continuously uh, or like revisit the, like for example, like I've worked with a lot of cardboard cutout imagery of my body, often working with third party companies to fabricate these um, uh, props that also function as a still life, that also functions as a portrait um, and drawing from the biography of, of my, my, myself, I guess like autobiography. I'm trying to like not use myself, my, me and first person pronouns um, for, for this. Uh, yeah, and next one. And then I think this is probably next to last to you, but this was um, something I made uh, planning to come back to the South. Um, I've, um, this is actually has this really amazing um, clues to where I'm going next in my work in creating, deconstructing and cr constructing um, my next uh, continuation of this project. It's um, collectively known as facades. And this will, this is hinting towards like uh, what I've been gearing up for is more of a studio based practice. And I've been in uh, my apartment um, cutting up um, uh, body parts, uh, not in a murderous way. Uh, I like how I just froze there. I'm like, not in a murderous way. Um, cutouts of uh, still lives and the background is also made uh, for as a photo backdrop. So everything that is um, that I'm lifting from is from my own archive. Um, and I think this is mostly influenced by uh, the lack of um, Asian American photography. Um, they have existed. Um, it's just that I didn't grow up knowing or experiencing the, those kinds of photographs until um, undergrad and graduate school. And I think this um, plays well into the his historical significance of when Chinese bodies were photographed after building the railroads, they were pushed out of the picture. So not they're not they're physically hinted. Their presence are physically hint or. or or hinted at, and as is my body. And oftentimes I try to uh, create the, the idea of, uh, of the cutout itself as a thing that does not belong in the picture. It's the thing that is the, that does not, is not part of the reality of the, the, the set. Um, because the set is a, a scene that I walk into or a place that I, I found that would, uh, been, that I have a connection to. Um, yeah, 
Is that the last one? Oh, yeah. And then this kind of ends at the, I think this is the last one too, but the, the last one was shot in my apartment in Brooklyn um, the week before a uh, shelter in place. And then this is a um, uh, shot in Lori's side uh, with my friend who's visiting and having uh, to bring, uh, to interact with my body with another Asian body to, um, kind of play around with the idea of like flatness and uh, belonging and desire and intimacy. So um, I think that's it. Oh, no, there's an installation shot. So hi, um, I totally prepared for this, if you can't tell. Um, but yeah, and I guess I'll end with uh, um, bringing back, um, looking at my own archives to create uh, this sense of play with my photographs. Cause I, I believe like with photography and picture making, um, the act of photography is the first act and the second act would be um, printing the print itself, the photograph as a physical object. And I started folding, folding the uh, prints and hanging my work on top of it as both like a decorative, but also an additional uh, uh, frame that kind of is it like a, serves as a soft collage, but also as a, a, a way to complicate the singularity of the in, in, of an image. Um, yeah. Thank you, Tommy. Um, well, why don't we just knock this question out really quickly from Brian? Um, not that it matters, but do you shoot analog? Shoot analog? I did. Um, when I started, uh, I was usually with a four by five view camera, and then. Um, and it just honestly got too expensive to do. So I uh, bought a digital medium format camera, which I, I've been using. So, but I'm hoping that I will return to the four by five because it's such a great uh, camera to work with. Thank you. Um, so now I'm gonna hand it over to Leonard to talk through his work um, and I'll again kind of drop his text bio into the chat if you'd like to see all the cool places he's been. Um, but yeah, so I'm gonna handle that and Leonard, please take it away. Cool. Thank you um, for having me. Um, so hi, I'm Leonard Riajaya. I, I think after COVID and the pandemic, I think I have, I don't know, updated the way that I think of my work and photography. Um, I use a large format camera to make my photograph and I went to school for photography, but also for theater. So the way that I think of my work is just like, a stage. I think of my frame as a stage uh, and my job as a photographer is to figure out how to make the best exposure of the experience that I want to share or take with me. Um, and I see a question about Kelvin and this is Kelvin. Uh, so uh, I'll, the way that I work is usually pretty improvisational. I would prepare as much as I can, but when I get to the location, uh, when I get to work with the subject, it becomes um, this exchange. Uh, and the great thing about using a large format is that the camera will just wait and it sits there. It will not give us uh, any result. We will not ever know what we just did. And that I find so liberating because I get to just be in the presence of my work or the people. And the people will not bug me to see, oh, how do I look? Do I look pretty? Do I look cute? So it's, it's just like, okay, we got to do this job and let's do the best that we can. So this photo I made at my cousin's home uh, I, I started working with my family first uh, when I go to Indonesia. So I grew up in Indonesia. I moved to California for my undergrad studies. And ever since I moved to America, I would go back once a year during winter break uh, to see my family. And, you know, I, I started in a theater program 
And then I started taking art classes in my junior year. And that's when I fell in love with photography. It's, it's almost like, whoa, I don't have to rely on actors. I don't have to rely on crew members. I don't have to rely on anything else but my camera. And it, it just felt like, whoa, I just feel so free. And um, I, I started taking my camera home to Indonesia. And, you know, during that time, I, I don't know, I told my family, like, you can help me get good at it. Like, we can practice. Uh, and of course, they wanted me to get, like, awesome grades in school. So they, they were always down. And I don't know, at the time, uh, I, I haven't... I hadn't come out to my family and quite honestly, it was just very nerve wracking. Uh, every time I go back to Indonesia, just knowing that Indonesia is still a conservative country and my family, I don't know. So every winter break, it felt like this would be the last time, Leonard, like this is the last time you're gonna be with your family before they banish you out. So. I guess instinctively, like, I want to remember as many things as I could. And one way that I could do it is to fit the camera frame, my stage, with as many things that I would want to remember from my home. And I usually use whatever's available uh, at my aunt's house, my parents' house. So this was my parents' uh, dining room. I pulled out all of my mom's fabric. Uh, you know, like curtains, bed sheets, uh, dresses, tablecloth, uh, shirts, and I kind of make it happen in the in the living room. And to me, it's just so I don't know, so dear to my heart to be able to use these patterns and fabrics because these are just things that I grew up with, the way that patterns and colors are part of the Indonesian culture, the Chinese culture. And when I think about what I would want to remember of my home, of course, these are my materials. Uh, we can go to the next slide, Erica. And uh, I, I, I feel like the freedom of working with a large format camera is just so awesome like when i get tired of working with people i can just lock myself up in my home or my studio and then <laughs> just make something happen uh so this was taken in my apartment uh in that corner right there but uh i made this photograph when when trump became president uh during that time I was also applying for a green card through marriage and the process of applying to green card requires me to document and submit proof of my love to my partner, my worth as an artist. Basically, I have to be able to document and put it and show it in material form that I'm a legit artist i mean it, it was kind of stressful in the beginning just because like i don't know at that time i had just got uh, i had just graduated from um grad school and just the thought of having to be able to prove on paper that i am a working artist it was it was just like whoa how do i do this but I did it. It felt like I had no choice but to submit, but also figure out ways in which I can push back and be able to experience my own power. And something like this, you know, I, the question like why Trump in the fortune cookies, it's, it literally is my fortune. I, you know, I can't vote. I am here because I want to stay here and I love America, but also just the thought of submitting myself and my livelihood and having the proof where I come from and the way I love, the way I perceive 
family and having to prove my worth so that I can stay in this country just, I don't know, becomes my material that I use to make work. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Uh, so yeah, so something like this, I made this photograph with my partner in grad school. Um, I mean, yeah, the history of me meeting, meeting him was also in the pretense of photographing him. Uh, I, met, I met Peter in grad school, you know, when I was trying to figure out, okay, who would want to be in my photograph? And I guess out of everyone that I photographed, I mean, he stuck around. So that's me and Peter. Um, next slide. Uh, paper house. Um, I made this photograph when I visited Indonesia uh, during my grandmother's um, pro uh, it's like a year after she was buried. Okay, her death anniversary. Um, a year after my grandmother passed away, uh, we had this ceremony, we prayed and we burned this luscious house paper so that she has this unit in her new home. So paper house is paper house for the afterlife. Um, next slide. Uh, and installation shot. I also put, I just put some photographs I made from 2020 just, just to have it in there. Uh, we can just skim through it. Uh, yeah, I think like the COVID and also just the pandemic has really been awesome in the way that I think of my practice, but also the way that I deal with the trauma that I never dealt with, but also how to take care of my own mental health. And I could see that I relied on photography to, to be my shield in the beginning, but also to be my protector, my reason. And being able to be here now today and reflect back on all of it through the lens of a global pandemic, I just feel so thankful. I feel so powerful in my, I just feel so thankful that I am able to put into physical realm the thoughts and the nightmares and the fears and anxieties that I have and learn from that experience of reflecting it back to me. Uh, yeah, I guess it helped me through my depression. I mean, the, the simple way to, to say it, uh, but also it, it is also a device that allowed me to connect with my community, my friends, my family. I made these photographs uh, right after Chicago reopened uh, with my friends from the gym. It, it was, I mean, I don't know, I got stuck in quarantine. I made some photograph at home, but I missed my friends. I missed being out and I wanted to make something great. And these are the photographs of that. Um, yeah, I think that's, I guess that's a quick intro of my work. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you. Sorry, I, I just got really nervous and got really cold really fast. That's why I just feel like, oh my God. But, okay. No, Thank that you. was great. Thank you very much. Um, and for anyone who's interested in those like later, like newer works by Leonard, they were done for the New York Times, right? And I'm going to drop the link to that article in the chat as well. Um, I think they're very fun. I very much appreciate that you were applying like your visual ones <laughs> to the pandemic. Um, <laughs> Yeah, um, so I will now, I guess, moderate a little bit of a discussion between the two of you. Um, 
And I think I really wanted to start with an idea that I've heard and kind of seen both of you bring up in various talks and interviews that you've done. Um, and it's this notion of photography as its own form of language, like its own form of communication. And I was wondering if you both might take a stab at expanding upon the idea and how it sort of relates to your image making. Yeah, um, I, I can go first. Uh, um, I think for me, uh, when I started working with photography, it was so much driven by the fact that I couldn't use verbal words to communicate my queerness, my myself and my existence, that I relied on photography as a way to protest, to push back. And now for me, photography has just become like a part of my life that I use art making and making photographs as a way for me to process information that I I need more time processing basically. Like all of the messes in the world could get really overwhelming, but if I take my time with it and kind of break down small bits and try to put it and fit it in a picture frame, it allows me more space and more power in facing those uncertainties or facing those overwhelming information. And what I, I do with photography feels like it's like a language that I developed on my own for myself. And I've developed that language uh, as a form of power. Um, it's, it's almost like making a photograph is just so much more fulfilling than yelling at someone's face for me. Like, I mean, I could get really angry and I could either like, I mean, I sometimes still do. Like I can just yell at someone's face or I can swallow my ego a little bit and then just bring it home and then kind of like dissect it and then kind of try to fit it in a form of a photograph and then making it hospitable and pretty. And the reward of doing that to me is just so much more fulfilling than just yelling at someone. So to me now, like uh, photography just becomes this language that I, I don't know, like I make things for myself and it makes me feel happy. You know, like in the beginning of the quarantine, I mean, I went through time of not making work and resisting making work. And of course, making work also requires effort and money. <laughs> that I, when I finally wanted to make photographs again, it, all, it already felt like, fuck, this is something that I'm good at and something that I'm thankful for. And it allows me to communicate my perspectives in one act of, in one instance of, a of showing a photograph. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, and I think specific to your pan, like the pandemic images you showed, I think there is something to be said for all of us feeling like we have been recycling the same phrases in our correspondence and communication lately. So I think the number one word I hear people complaining about is unprecedented because we keep using it over and over again. And that kind of speaks to this lack of fullness in our language where we don't have the words to necessarily articulate everything that's going on right now. And so I really do appreciate this idea of like, okay, well, let's tackle it from a visual standpoint and see what it is like to visualize kind of all of this chaos going on. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And Tommy, can I ask you for your opinion? Yeah. Um, well, photography is a language and language is a communal activity. Um, I, I think as evidenced by, uh, the staying power of Instagram over Facebook is that I think people will, can look at a picture and easily understand, like, or at least understand what they're seeing. Um, and 
I think that is the magic of photography is that I think it is in every public space and realm and private spaces as well, whether it's like art photography or the magazines at the checkout at the grocery store. There is like something very beautiful about photography being accessible to a lot of uh, communities and global uh, around the world. Uh, it's amazing. Like there's not, there's not a need for translation. And I think what, what I do in my process is a sort of finding a, a dialect, finding an accent, finding slang um, is a very metaphorical way to describe the different picture making, different genres that um, makes photography so um, not one thing or one um, universal language. And certainly there is uh, different approaches to what photography constitutes. But, you know, this is also uh, uh, historically the way that uh, we had divided photography has been always analog and digital. And now it's like, what is truth about photography? What is um, being represented? Uh, what happens when a photograph, what, when a thing is photographed? Uh, Gary Winogrand has, has mentioned that many times. And, and I think you know, I think a lot about um, the, the movie Arrival as a way to describe photography, uh, Arrival of Amy um, Adams. And there's like so many great um, linguistics articles that come around it about um, Sepher's worst hypothesis, hypothesis about um, language and being, um, there's linguistic relativity, relativity um, which is like there's a correlation between language and worldview. Um, and then a stronger uh, agree, agreement um, with among linguists is a linguistic determinism and that, that language determines the way we see reality the way we perceive it and I think that's a really uh it's it's a move it's a sci-fi movie about what happens when aliens arrive um and I I it's very much reminds me so much about photography it's like looking at something and how much it communicates and how much it kind of uh, reserves itself from uh, its truth telling or its its own realities. Um, and I think for me to, re I'm really specific in this kind of language of using self-portrait work and a lot of times performance and humor as a way to communicate um, or bring those accents forward. Um, because it's, I'm coming from uh, a performance background in a way and then like taught in a very um uh like Yale is known for its like street photography history like um with Walker Evans and taught Papa George and I came in with um very much like almost opposite of that everything's very constructed or like to the point where I try to create something that feels real um that feels like it is uh that one walked into into it. Um, and I think that's the, the beauty about language itself is that, you know, there's a difference between British and American English. And that's the reason is the divide, the distance between those two and how um, even accents in the United States is like, there's the New York accent to a uh, Valley Girl, California accent. And I think that's really what is so intrinsic about photography is that it's now everyone, almost everyone has some access to a camera to communicate these ideas. And um, I think that's um, proven true by Instagram and TikTok and uh, looking at things so quickly and maybe understanding it or maybe comprehending some sort of message from it. Yeah, thank you. My brain is like still trying to unpack some of that, um, but I think, Yes. <laughs> I think <laughs> part of like the efficacy, right, of social media image sharing platforms like Facebook and Instagram and part of people's rise and ascendance on those platforms can be attributed maybe, and maybe you can disagree with me though, um, can be attributed to kind of them presenting a consistent visual language that they can teach to other people. So people know what to look for and they mm -hmm. see like basically symbols and signs that remind them of a specific like account or a specific following. Um, and maybe this is a stretch, but I'm going to pivot it back now to Tommy again um, about how, well, and I think both of you are sort of 
working in this realm where you've generated this kind of visual language signature where people can look at your works and they say like, ah, yes, like that is definitely made by that artist who does a lot of works that are in a similar vein. And tell me, I think one of the hallmarks of your visual language, if you will, I'm gonna keep using the phrase, um, is your cardboard cutouts, right? And the self-portraiture that you mentioned. Um, and I think, well, you answered my first question of if you consider your works a form of self-portraiture. Um, and then I guess my follow-up question is why? Like why focus on your face? Why kind of put your face everywhere? When I tell people about it, about your works at the gallery, I tend to I tend to liken some of your works as like a Where's Waldo game where your face is Waldo. Um, yeah, so if you'll speak a little bit to that. Yeah, I think uh, Maxine Hong Kingston said her best is like, who's best to represent anyone else other than myself? Uh, and I think in context of this show, I mean, I, we had this conversation in, in the idea, like as a seed of the show was that it's impossible to survey like Asian American language because there's not in a, a space for it um, before. Um, many times. I mean, they have existed in the past, and but they're. Let's say, I, I guess, like I keep going back to that the word or the phrase "staying power" uh, that doesn't last, and I th think that's been detrimental to um, growing up, especially in the South, where it's um, you know craft is a big deal or a big. Um, um, way that people perceive what art is instead of like fine art or art itself and i f why you sell portraiture i think another reason is this i th is trying to locate n in a or I've, a kind of conf confirming my own existence i i like i really i've like kept, I keep going back to Susan Sontag a lot, like photography is the inventory of our mortality. And I think she's really true about that. And she also likened it to be um, tourist pictures itself. And I kind of like that as uh, describing like how I photograph is this, like I don't necessarily go on vacation. It's, uh, I, there's a lot of pleasure that's similar to taking a vacation and making a picture on vacation. And, and when I'm out in the world and trying to make fo my own photographs. And I think there's so much um, to say, there's so much materials to build up from um, this autobiography that extends not of myself, but also my mom's work and what happens when I incorporate her work as an extension to my own. And especially where our work is vastly, vastly different. Like her coming into um, or fleeing a country and then making pictures is, a different motivation and a different aesthetic altogether to where I was in a, a, a Southern art school and then went to a Ivy League for grad school. And it's completely like my relationship to photography is different. And I think that has its own, uh, own context, uh, its own like outs its own understanding and its own definitions that I'm still trying to uh, go back in make things that are compelling that is not it is about myself but also about this kind of experience that i feel that is across the board of like feeling othered and feeling different and feeling um uh where is this where are these spaces that i know exist but is not available or accessible yeah. and can i ask a follow-up of sort of in bringing up the notion of spaces, and maybe this is a little too literal, but I think one of the interesting, another interesting thing about your work is that a lot of your photographs are appearing in these interiors that are all very, very beautifully lit, um, but there is kind of no sense of where they are. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I guess I'm curious to know maybe a little bit about how you're choosing to photograph in what spaces, um, and also, well, yeah, we'll let you answer that first. <laughs> yeah, um, I'll do it quickly. Uh, um, uh, yeah, I, it used to be really about um, 
this kind of secret uh, thing to me. Like I would only exclusively photograph my family and friends in my close circle. And then it became about queer bodies and it became about Asian bodies. And then it became about like, I have to really photograph in the South. And there is something about this uh, short term urgency when I visit home. Um, when last year, when I was able to do, it was like my, I was averaging visiting uh, Memphis in the American South, like every a, a week or so every month. And um, mostly because I didn't understand it until I left. And then now I'm using photography to understand that kind of landscape that has treated my immigrant relatives in a very violent way. Like I had, um, like it was, it's a really dark history that the way that my family has like existed um, in the Southern landscape. And for, for I, don't know, I think uh, it's less important after being in quarantine now it's just like I want to photograph everywhere there are other bodies of work that is just uh, made because I'm traveling for work and um, I photographed my bed after I slept in it because that was like the I'm tired of photographing myself um, which is actually how th this uh, project came to be it was I'm gonna make a cut, cut out of myself and just like deal with that and yes I, I I'm a lot to deal with apparently um, and yeah, I think it's less important now for me, but it is like, I still uh, am inherently drawn towards like those subjects and the, the setting is important. Being photographing in the South to understand my place in it is very important still. Um, but now it's like photographing in New York or like in a studio is like um, just as important um, because that is like my everyday experience now and using photography to validate those. Thank you. Um, and then Leonard, I think to kind of backtrack to this notion of like another hallmark of like your own visual language, I was thinking a lot about sort of all of the items that you're accruing and putting together into your compositions. And I think you touched on it a little bit, um, but can I ask like how you go about collecting and sort of amassing all of the subjects that appear in your works? And I wanna tie this quickly into a question that we had um, from Jane. Hi, Jane. <laughs> um, and she's asking, Leonard, one thing I see happen in your work is a ton of repetition. Um, so tying to those material objects, um, can you speak about your use of multiples, such as in your pandemic-oriented photos, uh, like the dozen bottles of bleach lined up, the shoes? Um, yeah. Yeah, I think the the use of repetition has its roots in the way that I use patterns in my work. Uh, you know, like I grew up in Indonesia. Uh, in Chinese culture, my cultural background, my parents are Chinese. Uh, patterns are used in very specific ways. In Indonesian culture, different patterns signify different things. So for me, I was just always so conditioned to look at different patterns and kind of figure out how they function in, in the society. Uh, so uh, I guess in my work, in relying uh, in pattern, you know, like pattern only happen if there is repetition you know if it's just a single occurrence it's just that single occurrence so the way that i think of repetition is just uh that's a way to communicate pattern which communicate uh specificity uh, so when i'm in indonesia and i i just rely on the materials that i could find there uh, and in the pandemic work uh when i went to jean's home uh she was really proud and showing oh i got all of these clorox do you want to use it <laughs> it's like it's it's almost like this fucked up time it's almost like this is what i'm proud of it's almost but also this is so ridiculous i it's almost like she never had to like stock up on clorox before that when I arrived there, that was the first thing that she asked me, do you want to use all of these Clorox I got? I said, of course. Not only that I'm going to use it, I'm also going to put it center stage. That's why in the photograph, the Clorox are just in the center of the image. So 
really it's it's i think it just comes from the way that i am conditioned to look and to think uh i i don't know repetition just becomes as a way to show persistence also uh you know one one if you show it once it's it could it could be considered maybe accident maybe not but if you show it five times then okay there is a point in why i'm showing you all of those clorox and in other photographs in the photograph of all of my containers that i accumulated in quarantine uh, i don't know like i i guess my 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 point was like how do i communicate the passage of time in a way that makes sense to me but also makes sense of 2020 and then as i kept thinking about it i just see the corner of my house filled with like trash because i've been so lazy like throwing out all of the recyclables and i feel like fuck there it is that's the answer and and once I, I just make it, make that excuse, I just started compiling all of my trash. And, and then I use my expertise in lighting to make it pretty. So I don't know, like, I guess that, that's to say uh, being confident in my own impulse uh, and also be open to exploring it. You know, like one thing that I realized from, I don't know, being in this career is that I need to figure out ways in which I can alleviate stress in making work. You know, sometimes making work can be so joyous, but it can be so stressful as well. Because when I, when I use a film camera and then having to travel uh, into different immigration checkpoints and you know all of that stress can accumulate but when I when I start to think of what I want to achieve in my work and how what kind of experience I want to get from my work you know relying on humor uh, becomes what I need you know I don't want to go to the studio and then having to cry while making something I don't you know like if I'm overwhelmed with the world right now and I want to lock myself up, how can I use my art pr practice to make sense of the time I spend locking myself up and doing nothing? You know, that's also like a way for me to like find purpose in uncertainties. So the way that I use repetition now just becomes like, part of the way that I comprehend the world. Uh, it signifies repetition, it signifies specificity, uh, it signifies specific location and people. And I'm, I'm, I love using it, yeah. Yeah, and I think sort of having a repetition of objects also begets some of that humor that you mentioned and some of that joy at the same time too, right? Like taking a weird pleasure in the fact that like, yes, we have tons of bottles of bleach stacked up everywhere. Um, and I, I think that's a really lovely thing to try and do is to continue to perpetuate humor. Um, and on that note, I think I might pivot to a question that came from Jean, um, which is, I feel like we don't often discuss humor as a useful tool in the fine arts sphere, but both of you use it so skillfully. Um, and I wonder if you can share a bit more about how you arrived at the use of humor and absurdity in your work and when you first recognized how powerful it can be for you. Um, Tommy, would you like to go first? Yeah, I'm thinking about the first uh, photograph I saw. Um, it was in the Brooks Museum. Um, the first art photograph um, in an art museum, and it was a, 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 a Revenge of the Goldfish um, by Sa Sandy Scoglin. Um, I had, like, I taught at Rutgers, and incidentally, when I accepted the job, I didn't realize that she taught there as well. Um, so for, it was really exciting for me to work with her and learning about her 
process so much as when I saw her, that photograph, it gave me a lot of possibilities of that I can be a photographer and I can do it in the way that, uh, that, I, that I wanted to. Um, I th don't think it was until um, I met Pixie Liao. Um, she was in the op she was in graduate school at University of Memphis while I was an undergrad at Memphis College of Art, and so it was such a rarity to have another Asian <laughs> in Memphis and a, who was a photographer. And she was doing um, at the the, the basis on um, the first set of pictures for um, experimental relationship. And I, I went to see her show to uh, introduce myself because it, again it is to find another Asian person in the American South who is a photographer that is making interesting work um, really changed my perspective. Um, and uh, the humor kind of came out of uh, rebellion of like, it sounds so like, like teenage kind of uh, act of doing that, but it is rebellious because it's, um, I think uh, humor is definitely not talked a lot in, um, in painting or sculpture, but it is very like often used so many times, but I, I've, I've rarely seen it um, talked about as like a weighted uh, inter serious realms of conversations. Um, and I think when, I think that the analogy I came, I've came up with was this, uh, uh, when you tell a joke in someone's lab, it's like, there's this kind of deeper understanding where that response of laughed, laughing is, that's the that's the uh, confirmation that they uh, they heard it, um, but the question is is that do they understand the joke, um, or what is behind uh, uh, why we're laughing? And I think uh, incorporating it in um, visual art uh, has been such a way to, has been um, useful to really break down these barriers of like. Oh, oh wait, this is this is something sinister, something darker, something actually serious is at, at play here. Um, that I've been able to engage with a lot of folks to um, talk about. The idea of like desire being desired or being seen is very important. But um, when people look at the, the kissing pictures I've done, has like has this kind of weird misdirection of like, it's funny and then like you're like, but when you see it repeated, uh, as Leonard says, like it's, it, there's this kind of um, something being practiced, something being looked at over and over again. And then there's like um, a pattern recognition that comes out of it. And there is, uh, I think being humor, being using humor a lot is, uh, very useful, especially for um, people of color and people uh, BIPOC, essentially. And yeah. Yeah, and I think to jump on that wagon, uh, using humor as a way to push back is how I got started in, in focusing more of using humor in my work. Um, you know, I, I remember in my undergrad, um, you know, I moved out of home when I was 17. At that time, I was just a little kid. Like my facial hair hasn't come out. Like I was just a kid. But when my facial hair started growing up, growing out, like my family would give me such a hard time. Like they, they would come up with like shit. They would just come up with excuses just so that I like keep my face like clean shaven, keep my hair tidy and shit. So like one, one, one day for a project, I just shave all of my hair, my eyebrows, my, my mustache, my beard, and then I glued it back on. And then I sent that photo to my family. They just didn't know what to say. Like, but at that same point, like I realized, whoa, this is such a great tool to like protest and I could get away with it because for once they wouldn't say that I'm being a disrespectful son because I'm just, I'm, I'm just like doing my thing. But also like to be clean shaven like a monk is always like the, the look that is like the, the highest form that my family could like 
comprehend like Hmongs don't have their their hair so I just like I just send it to them and say look this is this is what is this what you want of me like why are you governing the way that I keep my hair and my facial hair and after that point I realized like whoa this is working and from that point I just try to even push it even more in my work uh you know at the time when I was still in the closet and making photographs I felt very scared uh but looking at the photographs I made during that time I could still pick up a sense of playfulness in the way that I put together the frame that I I feel like that's just what uh defense mechanism that I use in communicating and you know especially being a person of color and uh I remember so many times in critique like or in you know in, in just conversations it's almost like if I am able to make them laugh and like bring a point for them to think that would be my goal just because you know when i was in grad school all of these vernacular surrounding <laughs> compassion and listening to other people was not was not popular i i just had to figure out a different ways in which i could be heard and humor does that to me so for me like i just get good and i just want to get better at using humor to get what i want yeah <laughs> yeah i thank you for those answers um i think yeah it's interesting to think about the fact that we tend to laugh when we are both when we understand things because like it hits us in the gut and it resonates but we also tend to laugh when we're uncomfortable and we don't know what's going on um, and it's like a mechanism to react that is less threatening I suppose or it's it's easier to laugh than it is to actually come up with language um, and I, I guess I'm curious to know and I think some other people might also be curious to know how your family both of you I think Tommy your mother as well as Leonard the rest your all of your family um, if they tend to laugh in response to your works or how they kind of view them when you show it to them? Well, um, my family doesn't actually look at my work and I know that for a fact. Uh, uh, yeah, my mom only has gotten like a smartphone two years ago and is still learning how to um, navigate the internet world for the first time. Most of it's just YouTube cooking channel. So uh, thank you, YouTube. Um, but I think I could talk about uh, our, um, our space that we create in our collaboration. So I've been photographing my mom since about 2011. So um, on and off throughout different projects. And eventually, I th um, it became something when I come into town, um, and she knows that she'll like immediately respond to well, I'm off on Sunday or Monday morning. So come over to the house, I'll cook. I'll cook but uh, you can also make my picture. And it's become this um, uh, weird neutral zone that we created. Um, mostly, she doesn't really have a lot of, um, well, there's a lot of disinterest, let's say. Like not interested, but also not uninterested. Um, a lot of disinterest to art at itself. Um, unless it's like my aunt goes and she'll like be like my number one fan, I guess, um, which has happened. Um, but for my mom's relationship, I think the active picture making has became a really safe um, space that where um, there is, there is, there's this kind of character um, based on ourselves that we interact with each other. And I think uh, photography really brings it out of us is that there's this sense of perception that we want to be seen as and also would want to uh, but construct a scenario that we can like 
photograph and image in, in a way. Um, I'm really mostly surprised a lot when my mom just sets aside time and that's the first thing um, we discuss on the phone when I'm, when I'm about to come home is that there's this um, time that I can come over and this kind of permission and this kind of um, what she wants to wear, what she wants, uh, uh, what she wants to do, wants to portray. And oftentimes it's, it's just um, these little subtle directions that she would spend about like hours um, placating towards uh, the camera and then like we'll go off and like afterwards she, she'll take a nap and just like that was fun awesome okay cool and then you know the mother-son relationship becomes um, really um, apparent once we start arguing and then becoming antagonistic which has been the nature of our relationship on and off throughout the years um, yeah <laughs> And I mean, for me, uh, I would say my family enjoy it. Like, you know, they would say that I'm bossy because I am bossy, but like I provide a stage for them and we spend, uh, we have a great time making photographs. And a lot of the time we were just like laughing or like, I I sometimes like pushing the limit. Like, I want to know if my sister would be comfortable like covering her face with chicken skin, or if she would be comfortable gluing her eyebrows and uh, me getting rid of it. Like, I want to push all of it. And the way that I bargain with her is like through humor, but also through like this brotherly brother sister fight that uh, that like we have I don't know like I would help her do chores in exchange for sitting in my photograph because usually when I go visit you know like I'm only there for a month and mm -hmm. I, I I don't watch what they watch I don't I don't enjoy my time as much especially it just feels like uh, it just feels like a concentrated family time in a period of a month, 24 seven, it's just like, okay, I need, I need to create something that I can bring to America and be proud about. So I just use my work and kind of use humor also to like entice them, but also uh, as a way to open up harder conversations. Uh, mm -hmm. Like I, I, I came out to my sister and to my mom while I was holding a camera recording them because I was so afraid. I didn't know if they were gonna reject me right away. I don't know if, I don't know. It's almost like the camera was there to protect me and also to, to keep them accountable to their own responses. Like, I don't want them to be like yelling or like, I don't know, I don't know what to expect. Honestly, the camera was just like a friend, like a protector. So I think my family understands that because like, it's, it's not like I, I talk to them mm -hmm. every day. So, but through the experience of them watching me try to put a photograph together, try to coordinate uh, people's schedule and have people meet at my mom's living room and do something. To them, they see, oh, this kid loves doing this shit and he's pretty good at it. Like, yeah. let, let just like, let him do it. And my family doesn't really care of the result of the photographs that we make. I would, I would like, I would bring all of the film to America, process it, and then a month later after we made the photograph, I would send it to them and I wouldn't, I wouldn't hear back. They just left me on red, like, so, but that, that to me just explains, okay, what they value is the experience of making the photograph, not so much the final result mm -hmm. of the photograph. That is true. It's like that experience of just picture making is this weird like playground where they get to be, um, they have this sense of, of control of what they, how they want to be seen by the camera. Um, like, I think that's like the part of the, the, the amazing magicalness of, of, the, of the camera being present is the, the way that people react to it. 
Um, but it, that's so much true. It's like my family is, um, well, my family kind of tends to run away. Like they see me, it's like, oh no, he has a camera. Wait, I'm gonna go to the other room. I'm gonna take a nap. Um, yeah. And it's like, well, that hasn't stopped me. I photographed you sleeping and not in a creepy way. It's just that, <laughs> um, I mean, that's the only time I can photograph you. It's like, please don't post this to the internet. It's like, Hi, yeah. what's your dinner? <laughs> uh, but I, I mean, there is something really uh, beautiful that the camera kind of bridges that um, this kind of uh, collaborative experience, this kind of neutral space, this kind of like um, uh, way of uh, spending time with each other where it is like there is work being done, but there's, they know it's important. Like there's like some weird sense that I they like they know this is important for me and for you and they they really like put up with us so much I, I like I think that's like the way they show their 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 love and affection is that they're weird it's not a lack of participation but they're like un, um their willingness to put up with what's going on with um, who we are as the identity of what we are now as like photographers. You know, like this kind of family historian, this documentarian, even like where our work is kind of like either stage or this construct or this theatrical play, there is this 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 kind of nice sense of their own being when the camera is present that I find really enjoyable, but also like totally understand why like grandma ran away. Like that's the <laughs> most run so fast. I uh, I love my grandma. <laughs> yeah. Because it, it honestly, it brings the family together, but also sometimes just the way that, like you said earlier, the way that camera and picture consumption is just part of our daily lives. Mm -hmm. And in my case, I'm thankful, that's why I'm so thankful for the large format camera because they see, oh, okay, this takes extra work and they can't see the result right away, that it almost becomes a new situation altogether mm -hmm. that that for my family if i were to use a digital camera we wouldn't have the same experience and that's why i never tried with digital camera because they would just ruin the experience for me mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yeah and so i so and i'm I want to be cognizant of time, but I thank you both for bringing up those points because I think it is such a thing where, and of course I'm overgeneralizing and being stereotypical and my parents are on this call right now too, but it is a thing where Asian families don't necessarily talk about a lot of past histories and a lot of things that inform how the family is and the family dynamic. And I think it is so, so wonderful that yeah, it, there is an acknowledgement of like, okay, they don't understand what I'm doing, but they're okay with it because they know that I love it and they know that it's important to me. And that is like you said, Tommy, like indeed how they show affection, even though it doesn't necessarily come across as affection in the way we might be used to seeing and understanding affection. Um, yeah, so thank you for that. Um, I am going to maybe blitz through a couple lingering Q&A questions, and then I think we might have to call it a night. Um, but yeah, um, so Tommy, a question for you is that your use of your portrait is very unique as you incorporate yourself into the images. Considering sort of the history of photography, how did portrait photographers of the past influence you, if at all, um, to find your own voice? Yeah, I mean, there, I, okay, so I've, I, I grew up in the South, the American South, and there is this, uh, um, uh, like, an understanding and awareness after a while, like, after the fact of, like, oh, wow, a lot of what I've learned about photography is from a really Western standpoint. I've, like, and then growing up in the, what, I mean, the association of Memphis is all in the photography realm has always uh, been with um, William Megleston, who um, their family's been incredibly supportive uh, of me. I love them so much. Um, they're really great. And the a way 
that I've been influenced has always been through like the greats of Eggleston, Christian Berry, Sally Mann, um, and a lot of people that um, did don't look like me. And that's like something that that is um, understandable and not a detrimental thing, but has like created a lot of questions about like who, who, where were people that look like me and if they existed. Um, and one of the uh, uh, very few people that I can cite is Sang Kwang Chi, who existed in the um, 1980s, uh, and a lot of people know his work of uh, the East meets West um, project, where he photographed himself in front of um, very uh, touristy sites of um, not in America but also uh, Europe as well. Things that really call to mind um, uh, where we would visit and make a picture that we've been there. That Sontag, the photography is the inventory of our mortality. Um, and he is probably the only one I can really cite. Um, and the exciting thing about um, what I talked about earlier about using photography as an engagement, as a communal activity, photography as a communal activity is finding that kind of uh, language. And I think something that the show does really well is to bring together like one of those kind of dialects, that kind of slang that occurs um, to find other people that are doing something similar in their own photography, especially, and kind of have that in the landscape now. Because um, it was very difficult to find historically um, people that were making work that is similar to mine, which is kind of non-existent. Sing Kwon Chi kind of really hits the notes on a lot of the idea of performing as a character, as a communist emissary, um, dressing up, um, photographing self-portraits, black and white, and being um, from this place um, of uh, familiar territory. Um, and now I think it's just as important to, um, to have a lot of excitement that there are other like me now in this contemporary the escape, the use of humor, the use of photography, the use of performance, or this kind of theatricality, this autobiography, um, are ways to signify that there is this kind of uh, larger community that exists outside my realm. Um, so a lot of, I, I'm so thankful for uh, the people that I've studied with um, that offered their time with me. Um, Gregory Crutzen, Paul Graham, uh, uh, Jack Pearson, who I work for now, um, it's it's amazing that uh, to have their influence in my work and all people outside of it, Felix Gonzalez Torres, a lot of queer people have definitely influenced my work. That's um, aren't necessary aren't, aren't Asian or Asian American. Um, I think that's really important for me um, in talking about this intersectionality that is occurring that 10 years ago was not even a topic of conversation or people didn't know how to talk about that. Um, and I think that's why I like to be uncategorized um, or easy to categorize, which has been a, a fairly big criticism for me is that why can't your work be strictly Asian and why can't your work be strictly queer and or strictly sovereign? It's like, because uh, I'm all of those things and no one has made uh, the kind of work that really deals with those languages together. Um, and nor that they should be should exist in the same place. I don't think it's necessarily need, I need to hit all the notes, but to recognize that those are the the, um, the kind of photography I'm interested in making and that I belong in those communities or from those communities. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm gonna drop Sing Kwang Chi's name into the chat because I think he's a very important photographer that we all know and love and it's important for everyone to know him. Um, Leonard, the next question is for you, um, asking about Calvin, um, which if y'all will remember is one of his images where the Calvin Klein on doors everywhere. Um, the image Calvin is very interesting as a composition, but what is the message for the sniper rifle pointing at the viewer? Yeah. Um, so I made that Calvin photograph in my cousin's room. Um, you know, like I haven't seen him for a year and then all I know he's selling knockoff Calvin Kleins on the side to make extra money. And to me that is a great thing to photograph. And at that time he also had just bought like a BB gun. You know, it's just like these, these boys, I mean, he's, he's younger than me, but like, so, and also the atmosphere at the time was like, 
I was just uncomfortable because I was in, in the closet and I, I'm not sure if people are going to rat me out or if people are going to find out. So just the fear that I have just felt like the gun was pointing at me, you know, and it just, I just want to make that photo. I just want to, I just want to see what it feels like to have the gun pointed right at me and me as a photographer shoot it. I, I just needed to make that happen. <laughs> so that's, that's, I guess that's the story of the gun. Uh, but of course it signifies power. It, sign it, it talks about viewing. And for me, I, that was the fear that I have. I was so afraid that that would be the last time that I'm there before they shun me away. So before they shun me away, I'm going to go ahead and make a photograph of them just pointing the gun at me just so I can see it and make my peace with it. So I guess that's the story of the gun. <laughs> Thank you. I think it also weirdly brings up this notion that I think has been discussed a lot is like the language surrounding photography and how it tends to actually be a little bit violent in terms of we shoot photos, we take photos, we capture photos. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, and I think this last question is probably a good place for us to end. Um, how do you both, from Brian, how do you both honor pulling inspiration from your personal realities versus keeping certain aspects private? For example, like family, like your dynamics with your family and friends. Mm -hmm. I'm a little confused by it. I think uh, the blur between private and personal and public has been such I think that's so, such in the back of my mind because I, I, I naturally overshare a lot of information just in casual conversations. Um, I'm trying to placate that in a way where I'm just going to try to reserve and keep information to myself. But I think it's, um, it's easily all of those personal, public, and private um, tend to uh, blur between themselves and the way that it becomes material for me. And I'm not really interested in certain things. Uh, to be to be kept private, I think uh, it accesses a larger narrative outside of myself that um, I start asking questions of like, do I have permission to give the tell the story? Uh, it's not really of my own re um, of my own autobiography, but this is the kind of thing that is important that is occurring that has happened to uh, my family's lineage and experiences. Um, being in this country or trying to um, encapsulate this kind of experience that is either unique or not unique to myself. And I, in trying to image or make these pictures about these experiences as a, as a way to like, uh, to put it out there to like, to see it's real, like if other people experience this as well, or like some sense of like this kind of disembodiment of their own bodies, their own identities, where I think what photography does a really good job at is that it really um, treats the, our, our perception of what we're looking at as um, different to each viewer. And the, and the same goes with identity and identity politics when we present ourselves differently to different kinds of people all the time. like. Subconsciously or unconsciously? I mean, to me, like, if I can be responsible and use it to support me in communicating something, I will use it. Um, I don't know, like, I, I feel like, you know, I'm a millennial. I learned about sex on the internet with strangers. Like, guys, we're, we're, it's 2020 now. It's almost like, I don't even know what is private anymore. And I think my experience of having to like document everything about my life and submit it to the government really like prompt me to like, okay, if you want to know all of this shit about me, like th these are just information, you know, that I want to have power over it. I want to be able to decide and be responsible in using the information to support me. So for me, like, if, if I'm having a great conversation with my sister on, on a chat, if, if it serves a purpose, I will use a screenshot of it and put it in my work. Uh, 
but also like the the thing that I use are the things that I use are between me and my family. It's not like I'm gonna take an information and harass them because they're gonna be persecuted. So if, I mean, I don't know. Like, what is private anymore? Like, I don't know. Like, I'm I'm not gonna make photographs of my parents nude just because I want to make them nude just for the pleasure of making a nude photographs of my parents nude, you know? So, you know, there are things that I wouldn't do. It's just like me being a responsible artist and responsible adult. If something uh, communicates the way that people can be compassionate with one another, if it communicates empathy and trauma that it's just easier to show the real thing I'm going to use it fair game because of that purpose. So yeah, I guess just try to be responsible in the way that I pick and choose materials from my private, my life. Yeah. And I'm sure that you both have proven to your friends and family that they can trust you to do good things with their images. <laughs> um, yeah, I think we will call it a night there, but thank you both so much for being a part of the show, um, which is unfortunately coming down at the end of this week. Um, but it has been a very good time getting to show them off to people here in Houston as well as online. Um, I am going to drop a link to our last talk here really quickly before we all disappear, which is happening on the 17th. Uh, so that's the registration link. Um, but yes, so I think we will end it here. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everyone <laughs> that's here that we can't see, but thanks for making this happen. Mm -hmm. And nice to see you guys and chat with you. <laughs> <laughs> Bye.